Good morning. I'm Sergeant Lippy, and we are the Ivy Winds Woodwind Quintet. Uh, I'll introduce the members real quick. This is Specialist Daly over on flute. Specialist Erlinson on French horn. Sergeant Newcomb on bassoon. And Specialist White on clarinet. We're going to maybe come a little further in. I, don't, I think <laughs> I saw your arm. A little further? There we go. We see you. All right. We are going to play a piece by Arne Running called The Quadle Bay. It's basically a mashup of everything. You're going to hear all sorts of different classical pieces thrown at you pretty fast and furious. We hope you enjoy. Are there any questions at this point? Hey, what ins? Oh, yeah. Uh, 
<laughs> what instruments do we have? I only see a few people, so what, what do we have with us today? Flutes? Uh, yes, uh, a couple of flutes and players, uh, also jack, two great players, and uh, and then a collection of brass. Okay, cool. So well, we've, <laughs> we've got quite a few of the woodwinds. Uh, do we have any double reeds today? They're at home, but they're too big. Okay, all right. Yeah, so we do have obviously the oboe and the bassoon, if anybody has questions about those. I also brought my sax, I'm a doubler, I play saxophone as well, so we can talk about that a little later. Um, but first, we wanted to talk about breathing, which is something common to all of us. So Specialist Daly and I are gonna give you a demonstration of a quick breathing exercise that if you do this right, and we'll have you do it here in a minute, will help demonstrate how you should breathe. So give me a second to put down my oboe. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Good. 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 Glad. Glad it's Friday. Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. We feel that in the real world, world too. Um, okay, so we're going to go through a quick breathing exercise, and this is kind of to demonstrate the body's way that it wants to breathe naturally, and the way that the body wants to breathe naturally is the correct way to breathe. As we get older, when you're a baby, you breathe perfectly. It's amazing. And as we get older, different factors change how we breathe, and it gets all messed up. Um, so, but what we're going to do is um, certain lippy. I mean, he's going to breathe out all of his air on a four count. He's going to hold it for just a second, and without breathing in any more air, he's going to breathe out even more air on another four count, and then hold it again, and then same thing. One last time, he's going to breathe out any last little bit of air that he's got. Um, if he's doing it correctly, it should feel a little bit like he's about to die, and it will be, it will be uncomfortable. Um, but then when he breathes back in, the body will naturally take in that oxygen in the way it's supposed to. So here we go. Sergeant Lippy, go ahead and take a breath in and breathe it out. One, two, three, four. Hold it for just a second. Breathe out some more. One, two, three, four. Hold it again. Breathe out everything you got. One, two, three, four. Four, hold it and breathe in. All right, so you can see that his body, yeah, I see some laughter and some smiling faces. His body is just like, wants to take in as much air as he possibly can. So we're gonna have you guys do that. So if you're oh. holding an <laughs> instrument, yeah, you don't get away without doing it. Um, if you're holding an instrument, go ahead and carefully put it on the ground next to you. We don't want any instrument damage. Very nice. And you're gonna to wanna to take your hands and you're gonna put them thumbs outside and on your, on your legs close to your knees. So not up here, but down close to your knees. And what this does is it helps prevent your shoulders from tensing up. Sometimes when we breathe, we just go and it all tenses up up here. That's not good. So by doing this, you help your shoulders relax and prevent that tension from happening. So I promise this will feel uncomfortable. I also promise that you can do it. Um, so everybody take a nice deep breath in and push it all out for four. One, two, three, four, hold it. Push out some more. One, two, three, Four, hold it again. Push out some more. Everything you got. One, two, three, four. Hold it and breathe in. <coughs> Do you feel? <laughs> did anybody feel like they were going to die? <laughs> yes. Did any? Nobody actually died though, right? Yeah. No, I didn't think so. So, but the air, <laughs> the air that came into your body when you're playing your instrument, that's how you need to breathe. It came in quickly, 
and it came in the most efficient way possible. It's kind of like also if you've ever gone swimming and you go down into the deep end and you're underwater too long and then you realize that you need air and you're out of time to climb to the top and you're just like desperate to get to the top. I've been there. I know how it feels. Yeah, it's the exact same thing that we're doing there. And uh, so when you breathe your inch or when you play your instrument and you're breathing in, you want to make sure that you take that quick, full breath using your body as efficiently as possible. Do we want to have them play a little bit since they have their instruments today? Um, OK, so go ahead and pick up your instruments. Did we have anybody that specifically wanted to play for us? Sometimes that happens. We get people that want to play and get some feedback. Some I don't think we had any solo lists for example. We could play a couple of uh, pieces from the last semester. But, uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. <laughs> I don't think we, uh, we didn't have any solo lists really, but we do have, we can play a couple of chunks from some pieces we did uh, last semester. Okay. Why don't we try that and see how well we're hearing you? I am getting some some things. The sound seems to be cutting out. So, but go ahead and try playing something, and we'll see if it works. Okay, sounds good. Let's just do a few flats. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 we haven't played a little <laughs> Okay, so that's going to be hard to tell much because it, it sounds like bop, 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 bop. So we're getting a lot of dropouts. It's a little hard to tell what's going on. Um, but I'm trying to watch as you guys are playing and see what I see. Can we put the camera up so I can stand again? And what I didn't see, and of course I've only got a few of you in front of me, was that same breath that we got when we did the exercise, the let's kill ourselves exercise. So don't do that. But that, that exercise where it feels like really uncomfortable, when you breathe there, try breathing that way. I'll go, go ahead and have your band director start you again. Or maybe I can. Can you see me? It, I think you can see me. How big is the screen over there? Pretty big. Pretty big. OK, let me try directing you in. So what I want you to do when I give the up, I want that big full breath, OK? Big full breath up, and then I want you to play forte. And just we're going to hold the B flat. Hold the B flat as long as you can and blend it with everybody around you and just get a nice big forte, the best tone you can possibly produce for as long as you can produce it. Now, when you're done, when you've run out of air, just stop, put your instrument aside, and let's see who can hold it the longest. Ready? Here we go. Big breath. <sighs> Keep holding as long as you can. We've got some people still going, it looks like. Good job. All right, is everybody out? I can't quite tell. Looks like everybody might be out. Cool. So that was maybe 15 seconds at the most. And what I'm going to tell you is you want to try to build that up even more. Uh, great wind players can hold a note for at least a minute. So you want to be able to, and I know up here at this altitude, I find it's a little harder than when I was down at sea level. That's, it's a challenge. Um, but that's something we want to work for, is to be able to hold a long tone for even longer. Uh, and then just, that'll help you make longer phrases, that'll help your breath control, all that kind of stuff. Do we have any questions yet? I'm going to keep asking if there are questions as we go through this, because something might spark some curiosity. I would definitely want to ask, uh, you can do this now or later, but the same doubling question we had yesterday, because we have even more doublers in this ensemble. 
And, okay. Uh, start, we actually have Ashley at home is just like you. She plays alto sax and oboe. So um, we've got plenty of uh, flute sax doubles and uh, clarinet uh, saxophone doubles, etc. Cool. So yeah, let's get into doubling for a little bit. I am a doubler. I started on saxophone in fourth grade, picked up the oboe in seventh grade. I've had a smattering of time with flute and clarinet over the years too. Um, my degrees are on saxophone. Oboe has always ridden in the coattails of the saxophone. I've kept it up, played in orchestras and bands. And then when I joined the army, I joined on saxophone. Was in the army about 10 years on sax and then decided that I was gonna switch over to the oboe uh, for various reasons, which I won't get into too much. But now I'm officially an oboist for the Army, so I get to play in woodwind quintets and concert band and things like that. I still also get to play saxophone out when we do ceremonies on the parade field or marching uh, downtown or anything like that. And what I'll tell you, being a doubler, is it's really important to figure out what the commonalities are between the instruments that you're playing. For example, I'm sure if you're playing saxophone and flute, you've figured out by now that a lot of the fingerings are the same. That's good because it helps you transition from one to the other. But beyond that, figuring out what the differences are too. For example, the breathing exercise I just showed you works really well on sax. Let me go get it real quick. <coughs> So on saxophone, I've got a big giant tube and I can fill it up with the air and I don't really have to worry about having too much air very often, especially if I'm playing loud. So I can take that big ginormous breath. <sighs> And I can just play. On the oboe though, here, can you hold this? Oboe's a different story. <laughs> oboe has a little tiny opening. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hear you. It's a small opening, that's the idea. <laughs> Yeah, ob oboe has a little tiny tube to fit all that air through, and it, you end up with a lot of back pressure. So if I take a ginormous breath on the oboe, it doesn't go anywhere. It's still in my body, and it'll still be in my body after I've held that note for a minute. So what happens on the oboe is I end up hyperventilating and passing out if I don't manage it differently. <laughs> So for oboe, I have to actually take a smaller breath than I do on the saxophone, and I have to manage the air differently. When I get to a phrase point on the oboe, I have to breathe out and then back in. So it actually takes longer to deal with the air. And some breaths I won't actually breathe in. Some breaths I'll breathe out, and then the next breath I'll breathe in. So air management on this instrument is a lot trickier than it is on the saxophone. And understanding that is part of what it means to be a doubler on both. They're both reed instruments, but the double reed on the oboe is a, is a challenge in itself. I had to learn how to make reeds, and I do make my own oboe reeds. The cool thing about that is everything I know about making an oboe reed translates to the saxophone. So when I work on my sax reeds, it, that knowledge translates, and I can make my sax reeds work better too. So a reed is a reed to a, a degree. Now. If we're talking the single reeds, clarinet and, and my clarinet player can jump in and correct me if I ever am wrong. This is a specialist white again, our brilliant clarinet player. But for saxophone and clarinet, the single reed mouthpiece that we've got is a commonality. We also have similar fingerings, but the way that I approach the saxophone, if I approach it the same way as I approach the clarinet, I'll end up with a sound that's too open. So can you, can you demonstrate a sound where your voicing is just way too open? Yeah. Okay. And now bring your voicing down to your fingers. Okay, so on saxophone, the way he was playing at first is normal. 
Whereas if I play what he did to make the clarinet sound good, then it sounds like this. Sounds way too pinched. So that's a difference in how I use the embouchure and voicing between clarinet and sax. And real quick, so voicing is a concept you may or may not have heard, single reed players, but it's what we do inside our mouth. The embouchure is ten, what we think of on the external part, what we do with our lips and our jaw. The voicing is what we do on the inside. And if you can whistle at all, I'm pretty terrible at it, but if you can hear this at all, <laughs> pretty bad, right? It's even worse when I have oboe embouchure going on. But that what I do to change the pitch when I whistle, go ahead and try that for a second. Just whistle up and down and feel what it feels like with your tongue as you're changing pitch with your whistle. Just take a second and do that. Yeah. So now if I translate that to the saxophone, it sounds like this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you can see well enough, but I wasn't moving my fingers at all. That's all internal with the mouth. I'm not moving my jaw either. And that's voicing in a nutshell. And that's the biggest thing that I can do to make sure that I can play saxophone and then transfer over to the clarinet or the oboe or whatever is try to get that embouchure right. I'm going to let the flute, our flute player, Specialist Daily, talk a little bit about the flute aspect of things. Can I play one of these? Good morning again. Um, I'm so glad to see some flute players. I heard you were all at home yesterday. Um, anyways, the flute. I want to talk specifically a little bit about tone on the flute. Oh, hey, guys. Um, <laughs> the flute is a unique instrument in the fact that it is the only one where you have to blow across the instrument in order to make the sound. If you look around the room, all of the other instruments, aside for, you know, percussion, they're in a family all of their own, um, you have to blow into the instrument to get the sound. Flute, you're blowing across. And because of that, it takes some because the flute is unique it takes some unique um, skills to make it sound good and um, specifically when I think about tone I think about the inside of my mouth similar to what Sergeant Lippy was saying changing it to make it sound good on clarinet or on uh, what's that saxophone brain fart sorry guys <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you have to, changing the, the inside of your mouth will change how you sound on the flute. The inside of your mouth is your resonating chamber. So you've got to make that as big as you possibly can. So when you play, you want to think nice and open on the inside of your mouth. So if you just take your hand and kind of go back to where your molars are and kind of stick your fingers in between your molars so it kind of forces your jaw to open. You feel like really like yeah. You feel how open that is. It's kind of weird, isn't it? That's how open you should feel when you're playing the instrument. Um which is a whole other thing because you're like but I can open my mouth here, but you can't really do that when you're playing. But I promise, if you really try and focus on making that open, as open as you can, then it will improve your tone greatly. I'm going to play uh, just a nice B natural real quick. I'm going to start with my mouth on the inside, like closed. And as I go, I'm going to really open up and see if you can hear the difference in the tone quality. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Let's try this again. Take two. There we go. Did you hear, thank you. Did you hear the difference as I went, how it changed? Yeah. yeah. Yes, okay. You're not yeah. lying to me? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that was simply me going from a closed jaw to open as I went. So I want you to give it a try. Just do it once without changing anything. Just how you normally play on a nice B natural uh, just for four beats. Here we go. One, two, ready, and. Okay, now have that sound in your head and do it again. Think nice and open. It's going gonna, it's gonna to feel really weird, but think nice and open and we'll do the exact same thing again. One, two, here we go. One, did it feel different? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Did it sound different? For the rest of the band listening, did it sound different? Even just a little bit, maybe? Yeah. It takes some practice and some work. I spent, I don't know how many hours in the practice room just really focusing on that and making sure that I was nice and open. Um, I would actually, and be careful with this, you don't want to choke, that would be terrible. Uh, I would actually practice with erasers in between my molars while I was playing. I wouldn't do it for long term, for like five minutes of my practice time. And it does, it feels really weird, but it forces your jaw to be as open as it needs to be while you're playing. If you don't have erasers, carrots can sometimes work and you have a nice snack to go with it. So, I mean, win-win. Yeah. Um, but some exercises that you can do, and this is this will work for all the instruments across the board. Um, and I'm sure that your band director has harped on it at some point. But long tones, are we all familiar with long tones? Yes. Oh yes. Um, specific exercise that you can do on flute. This is the one I do. But as I said, it'll work for any instrument. Is you? I start on B natural and I play it and then I go down to B flat and I hold it as long as I can, making sure that my tone is as nice and beautiful as I possibly can. And then I will do it again with vibrato, if vibrato is something with which you're comfortable. If it's not, that's okay too, you'll get there. And then after B to B flat, you go B flat to A, A to A flat, A flat to G. Do we get the pattern? Okay, good. You're just going down chromatically. And then you start on B natural and you do the same thing going up. B natural to C, C to C sharp, C sharp to D, and so on and so forth, as high as you can go. And for other instruments, if, um, if those notes don't work for you, just pick a note to start on, kind of in the middle, comfortable range of your instrument. Um, and again, I do it once with no vibrato, and then once with vibrato, because vibrato is something that I have to, that we all have to spend time on to keep it consistent and keep it sounding good. Um, there was something else I was going to say. Oh yes, make sure while you're doing this that you're listening and that you are adjusting. Adjust the inside of your mouth, adjust your aperture, your embouchure, whatever you need to make it sound good. And if you do one that's like, like ooh, that just did not sound very good, Guess what you can do? You can do it again. It'll sound, if you do it again, yeah, I know, it's amazing, isn't it? If you, <laughs> mind blown. If you do it again, <laughs> then you have a second chance. And it's just you practicing. You can do it as many times as you need to. Uh, does that all make sense? Yes. yes. Are there any questions from the flutes or anybody out there in the big wide world? Okay, wait, I have one. Perfect, let's hear it. Okay, so like, you know, like when you were saying like trying to open your jaw as big as you can, how like, cause it's, I feel like it's like, how do you do that? Cause I feel like your lips kind of like, 
clothes a little bit to just like make the sound. So you're right. As a flute player, you kind of have to find that balance of how open can I get it while still maintaining my embouchure. Yeah. Um, and again, it's going to take time in the practice room. And you're going to find, oh, like I opened it a little bit too much. There, there goes everything. And I just can't play it anymore. So you will have to sit and take some time and figure out where exactly is that kind of breaking point almost where you can go before while your tone still sounds beautiful and before it starts to do the opposite. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You're so welcome. Any other questions? I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Can you hear me? I think we got this mic on. Yes. yes. Yay, all right. Nice. We're gonna put this one away then. Gives us a little more freedom. So kind of back to that too, here's a, a little thing from a non-flute player, but some, you know, a guy who's tried to learn flute. If you say, mm, and then try to open your jaw and see how far open you can get your jaw before your lips just split apart. So, mm, and that can be a way to kind of test the waters mm -hmm. of how far you can get that open. Um, do we have French horn players today? We have one was that one? At one home. at home, yes. One at home, okay. So, sorry. <laughs> He's logged in. I can, talk to, I can talk to some French players still, though. Okay, yeah, we have our French horn player who wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about some of the brass issues. Um, so, uh, I have a couple of things that I, I'd like to, to talk about, but just like up front for any brass players out there that, that haven't, had some questions from the earlier groups or French players who are at home. Uh, is anybody having any questions regarding just like from a French horn or brass playing standpoint at the moment before I go into thing, any, anything? Not seeing, okay. So one of the things, um, so I'll, I'll just go and move into what I wanted to kind of mention to you guys. Um, so. As, as a horn player, the struggle is real, uh, but uh, the, one, of the thi one of the biggest things that I really love to harp on as an instructor, but also as a, horn, as a professional horn player myself, is that this instrument and, uh, and just dealing with the harmonic series is really like a, a massive challenge really at the start and trying to like learn everything and trying to make sure that you're, the right, you're playing the right partials you know, like you might have the same fingerings, but it's like the same note. So early on, what I usually love to tell students, uh, or like you know anywhere between like middle to high school horn, uh, high school horn students, is that it is so important for you to be able to hear what you are about to play before you play it. And the reason being is is that if you're able to have that uh, that skill set. It's going to be able to help you to autocorrect yourself, like in real time, and and basically being a, uh, being able to correct yourself and play notes accurately, and being able to do what you need with your embouchure and your air, to be able to play what notes are written on your page. So, for example, if I were to like do one of the beginning of the horn concertos. The beginning, like the first two notes, is like a major six leap. It's quite a bit like like an F in the staff to a D, like in the middle of the staff. <laughs> Every time that I pick up this instrument and before I actually start playing, I'm actually hearing what that sounds like in my head before I actually play it. Um, one, of the, and one of the ways to do that that I really am really big on is actually singing it before you actually play it. So I, what I usually tell my students is like, if I were to sit here, I would be like, can, can you please like sing, sing what you're about to play? And I would have them go, Ta -dee, ta -dee, ta -ta 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 -ta. And I'm also having them like 
work on the articulations too, but that's a little bit later. Uh, but trying to get those, trying to make sure that the voice is matching what you want the horn to sound like as well is a very important aspect. So then we'll do that a couple of times. I'll do maybe, and then another big thing is how you sing it also reflects on how you play it too. So if you're, if you're going out and you're singing and you're going to go like, ta -di, ta -ti -a, ta -ta -ti -a, ta like what's going to actually happen is you're going to play it at that volume as well. And so it's really important to sing out loud. And it's not, and you don't have to be afraid of it. They're like, it's a no judgment zone or anything like that. At least, I, at least, you know. But um, it's really important to being able to sing and project your voice, especially as a horn player too, because our bell is literally facing the wrong way. So we have to work, we have to work a little bit harder just to make sure that like our voice is being able to project over the ensemble to the rest of the audience, particularly those to like the very far back in the percussion section like over there. But, you know, we just want to make sure that we're balancing out to the rest of the sections in the band. So I have them sing at, a, at, at like a mezzo forte. And here's a question for you all. Doesn't matter what instrument or like for anybody in, the, in there. Can someone describe to me what mezzo forte is? In their own words. Is that medium loud? Okay. So, yes, from a from a technical standpoint, that is that is correct. Um, my my gentle loud. Okay. So, what I like to think of when I hear the word mezzo forte is I want to be able to have my sound fill the room that I'm in. And there's a very specific sound to that. So if I were to play just a little bit at a something less than a mezzo forte. That's kind of like a, a piano level. But if I really... I'm in a big space here too, but so if I really want to try to create, like to fill this room up with my sound, I have to really, I, I'm not really trying to play loud for much, I'm just trying to take a bigger breath and just use that air to my advantage and spin it through the instrument. And you can also kind of tell as a brass player, I'm not really trying to get that brassy tone. That's kind of when we start talking about like the forte, forte plus, forte, fortissimo, kind of things like that. So I'm basically trying to push the boundary of being able to fill this instrument up with sound without getting that brassy tone. That to me is kind of where mezzo forte lies on the grand scale. So being able to sing at that level and also being able to play at that level are two, are one of the, are two of the primary things that I really try to focus with my students. And going back to like being able to you know hear what you're trying to do before you play it. So like let's say um, there there's like you know the like the Avengers theme song or anything like that. Something that you can know by heart is, is something and like you could like just pick it up and you could be like, oh, I know what that is. And that's the kind of level that you need to approach all of your excerpts in your band music as. If there's something like, even if it's accompanimental, like it can still be plenty difficult. And, but like even in those passages where you have to be, you have to bring your, yourself and your sound to the fore, you have to be able to hear that and know it by heart before you actually play it because that's going to really help increase your accuracy on a subconscious level. And if something happens in the performance, you'll be able to be immediately correct it and be like, oh, I overshot it or oh, I undershot it. And speaking on that level, if you if you're notice if like one of the other things that I think is important when you're when you're playing and if you're missing notes, 
you need to be critical on yourself and ask, how am I missing those notes? Am I actually overshooting or am I undershooting? Those are things that I would really try to emphasize because that's going to focus more on your airspeed and that's going to be able to help you kind of develop the correct technique on how to go about that. So I'm, I know I'm kind of pushing time here, so I'm just going to ask one more time if there's any questions before I give it back to Sergeant Libby. I see something in the chat there. Okay, so the right hand, this is, this is what we use to tune with. Um, so usually when I'm playing with chords or anything like that, if I have the third of the chord, I need to bring it down. So I'll, I'll actually, if like, so from this standpoint, I'll be able to bring, like adjust if I want to go flat or if I want to go, if I want to go sharp, I'll open up a little bit more. And that's how I really try to adjust within my section. But also, if I'm like in a smaller ensemble, I'm trying to tune with the rest of the ensemble as well. I'm using my hand as a tuner, and I'm not using these slides so much as a tuner. It, there's a couple of notes on like brass instruments, like if you ever have like that one and two fingering, uh, that tends to, that tends to go sharp quite a bit of times. So then I'll try to like find an alternate fingering as well. But if that's, if that's not go going the way that I want it to, I'll also be adjusting with my right hand within the bell as well. That's kind of, what, that's kind of my personal approach to using the right hand in that sense, if that helps. Any more questions, or can I give it back to Sergeant Libby? All right, well. Thank you, you Special Sergeant Good. No problem. Thank you, Sergeant. And uh, we're about to wrap up here, I think. Uh, do we have any other questions for any of us or any aspect of what we do as Army musicians before we take off? No. no. I have one final thought I want to leave you with, and we've kind of touched around this subject, but it's a concept called the sound concept, and it applies to all of us. And if you want to sound really good on your instrument, you need to develop a mental image of how you want to sound. And that is your sound concept. To get there, listen to a lot of great recordings of great p artists performing on your instrument and start putting those in your mind and being able to play them back almost like a recording in your head. Once you can do that, you'll start creating it yourself. All right, with duets, how do you line up together? So lining up together in any part is all about time. Uh, each individual has to master time. And that's really one of the key components of music. We all play with a metronome, I hope. If you don't, you should. Uh, and if you don't listen to great music and really try to feel the time, uh, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but if you dance, that's time. If you can translate that bodily motion of dance to music when you play, even if it's simply just left, right, left, right, that is developing an internal sense of time. That's the start. The other is intonation and just general sensitivity and experience. The more you do it, the better you get. I think we have to let you go. There's one more. Do you have any other tips for correcting embouchure when switching between oboe and sax? Yeah, uh, the biggest thing is practice. Uh, without getting into individual like if you were studying with me privately, we could talk about individual things, but it really boils down to practice. One thing you have to realize, and I'll try to get up here on the camera, is the embouchure, meaning my lips, are just a means of, of dampening the reed. So if I don't let the reed get dampened properly, it's gonna sound nasty. All I'm doing with my embouchure is putting the right dampening factor on the reed. If I over dampen it, well, the reed's dry and it's not on an instrument, so it's a little hard to say. But if I, if I don't put enough mouthpiece in my mouth, then it sounds stuffy. If I have too much lip in my mouth, it sounds stuffy. If I've got too much mouthpiece in my mouth, it sounds honky. If I don't have enough lip, it sounds honky. If I don't bite with the right pressure, it can either sound too pinched if I'm overbiting. If I'm underbiting, it can sound too open. It's all a matter of dampening that reed to the proper amount so that it's not too much or too little. Beyond that, we would have to talk more uh, with more time. 
Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure to work with you. We hope we can do this more, especially maybe someday we'll get to come into your school in person and take the masks off and get back to life more as normal. I think that would be great to actually get to hear you play uh, live and in person because there's so much more we could do. Uh, beyond that, it's been awesome. Have a great day. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah.